This film is a product of the combined concerns of the Research Centre on Migration, Refugees and Belonging, CMRB, at the University of East London and several activist organisations working in this field. It deals with everyday bordering and is part of the EU Borderscapes research programme. Borderings have come to occupy a major part of the everyday lives of most people and especially with the effect of the new Immigration Act of 2014, we find that most of us are required to be both border guards and are suspected of being illegal border crossers. This evolution of bordering from the margin into the center, from the extraordinary into the everyday lives is now threatening to destroy the conviviality of pluralist metropolitan London and multicultural Britain in general. There's a huge danger that social relationships that we've been developing over years are going to start breaking down as we feel that we're being monitored by the people who surround us. The hostile environment that it's creating is not just a hostile environment which is going to be experienced by the people who might currently be trying to cross to Britain. It's affecting all of us and it's affecting all of us in very negative ways. Although the 2014 Act is introducing the border into everyday lives in many different ways, we became particularly concerned with how it's introducing further bordering processes into areas of health, employment, education and housing. Prior to the, the mid 1990s, the, um, the, the, the general approach to immigration control was basically concentrated at the border. Um, the UK was a, a difficult country to enter, but the general rule was that once people had come into the country, it was easy to establish yourself here. The significant change came in the mid 1990s, um, particularly as a consequence, I think, of, of refugee movements. Uh, where well, the government felt that it was on having been required to admit people over the borders because um, they had rights that had to be investigated under human human rights law and refugee law. Um, then the emphasis became much more on maintaining uh, surveillance over these migrant communities after they'd come into the country. And we started seeing systems of identity cards um, being brought in but this moved up a step even further by the, um, by the end of the 1990s and in the, the beginning of the noughties, um, when in addition to the refugee um, flows coming into the country, there was also a lot of evidence of significant migrant worker uh, movements uh, coming in. And the government uh, felt that it was under pressure from public opinion and from the, the tabloid media um, to give an account of itself of what was happening to all of these immigrants who were being admitted into the country in order to, to take up employment. Another element of it came in, in 2005 when the, the Home Office released its five-year plan and one of the, the central tenets of that was that there would be no automatic link between entry into the country and eventual residents, um, that the immigrants who were coming in had to be checked periodically at different stages, even when they were, in the, in the Home Office's terms, legal immigrants. Um, and at that point, you started seeing a lot more interest in um, things like employer checks on people's immigration status, with a, a, a substantial fine if they, didn't, if they didn't do this in the region of £5,000 and the possibility of that being ramped up to £10,000. And I think at this point, all of these different currents started to coalesce, the, the monitoring of uh, refugee movements, the, the surveillance of uh, migrant workers um, and it, a, a new culture of immigration control very definitely began to click in. 
the Home Office themselves, they, their website, they published a, a name and shame um, section, which listed all of the businesses that they were, uh, um, who they, they, they'd raided and they'd found um, undocumented migrants on the premises, uh, and who had been subjected to fines. Um, and it was typically in the order of about 70% of these um, could be identified as being ethnic minority businesses. They were typically to do food businesses, um, just from simply the names of them. They were restaurants, um, or they were grocer shops that were specialising in Asian or Chinese food or Caribbean food. It was a, an operation that was based on the low-hanging fruit. Um, we simply sweep through um, areas where there are lots of ethnic minority businesses and um, a, a, a large migrant uh, community. Um, and we presume that uh, with fairly low level intelligence, we're always going to be able to catch somebody. It was intended to create a hostile environment. Um, it was created, it intended to create a set of circumstances in which people felt the heat, they felt the pressure on them. But the problem with that is that, uh, you know, an environment is a broad terrain. It's something, it's an atmosphere. It's something that we all have to walk across or, or walk through. Um, a hostile environment isn't just experienced by the people who are sort of narrowly targeted towards. It's experienced by people who are on the edges as well, the neighbours, the friends, the, the, you know, the people whose kids go to the same school as the people who are, who are being targeted. Um, so there's a huge ripple effect of this hostile environment that extends right the way from the, the targeted irregular migrant community and hits everybody who's in the vicinity. We always say we are a victim of our own success because we have so many restaurants we expanded, but the skill staff not developed. There are reason because government doesn't allow us to bring the skilled worker from overseas, and this industry is collapsing. Restaurant owners, you know, the responsibility was imposed by the government policies that they should every time they recruit new the employee to the restaurant, they have to check their status, especially the immigration status. But as a restaurant owner, we are not an immigration officer. How do we know how to check and everything? We try our best to maintain our file and everything. And this is the extra burden and we get regularly victim. They come, raid, and uh, then they say 20,000 fine, 10,000 pound fine because he got in a, uh, the person is working, he's not supposed to work, your record checking was not properly correct, so you have to pay fine. And raid is a killer. Because what they do these days, they raid when restaurant is running. Our restaurant is busy Friday and Saturday. And those people actually come to raid your restaurant in a bad manner Friday night, when it's busiest time in the whole week. And what they do, they come to the restaurant, lock the door, and they treat everybody like a criminal. Suppose you are a restaurant owner, and you built a reputation for years and years. So that way, your 30 years of work, or so 20 years of work, down the drain. So when 20,000 or 40,000, if there is a two people imposed to the any restaurant, small business, this is another pressure of closing the restaurant. And I find a lot of them are cannot pay, so they sell it and goes away. This is not solving the immigration issue. This is damaging businesses. And I don't see why they're doing it. International students are incredibly important to 
British universities. I don't think you'll find one university that would disagree with that statement. It's obviously there's a, a financial um, benefit to us, but that's not the only benefit. It's very much the rich sort of tapestry they bring with the the, the different uh, from a cultural perspective, a social perspective. We are a global uh, in community now. Uh, and it would, it just wouldn't feel right if we didn't have our, our global citizens sitting here in amongst us. But over a period of time, the requirements, the Tier 4 requirements, which is the student visa route, um, have changed. It's the introduction of biometric immigration documents, which are called biometric residence permits, which all migrants who come to the UK for six months and more will be issued with. And that has a massive, massive implication for institutions. Certain nationalities of students also have to um, enrol with the register with the police. Um, and in London, it's done at the Overseas Visitors Records Office. And in their passport, it's stamped that they must do that within seven days of arriving in the UK. So you can imagine the anxiety that this is going to cause. Late last year, um, the, the government introduced credibility interviews for in-country applications, so meaning from within the UK. Um, so, you know, we've got a situation where somebody's credibility is tested back in their home country. They've then satisfied that. They've come to the UK. They can then be called for a credibility interview uh, again. From seeing some of the the out of country visa refusals, they do seem to be, you know, a bit unfair. I think, you know, where it is very much the judgment of of an entry clearance officer um, about how credible or not somebody is. Yeah. And we know through some of our recruitment teams that have spoken to the, to the applicants and, and sort of built a bit of a relationship and they come back and say, gosh, I'm really surprised that, you know, that was such a good student. We had a, a student, they were assessed, you know, really, really incorrectly. Um, and it was so clear and apparent, but we had to wait for an admin review process. But by the time that happened, the student had missed the intake. So it just seems so unfair for something that was just not the student's fault. We want a positive message going out saying, come to the UK, we offer a good education system here. Um, but I know from going abroad uh, myself um, of the negative publicity that it gets, particularly in Southeast Asia uh, and in places like India, where it's front page news when new legislation comes in and certainly the the numbers of students from those countries has decreased really significantly and those students are now going to Canada and Australia where the visa rules have uh, have been reviewed um, by the government um, to attract international students. I also belong to a, sort of a, a lobbying group called London First, you know, which is very much about looking after London's business interests and you know, they've got similar concerns um, that they are finding it hard to attract you know, talented global uh, people to come work in the UK um, because of the visa requirements here. There has been a damage done, I think. I've certainly seen it. I work there on the ground, I've seen it. So if somebody tells me something different, uh, well then I, my experience doesn't match up with that at all. Um, and that's had a huge economic impact, uh, but also a cultural impact on us. have increasingly been asked uh, by the government to actually take the role of uh, border agents and immigration officers and we are very very concerned about that as SOAS and um, particularly in terms of monitoring students attendance. Um, so you know we've been sort of trying to, to see how we can um, follow government regulation being of course very scared about the repercussions if we were to resist. Most of my PhD students are international students 
and many of my students are women from the Middle East, from Asia and Africa. And I personally think that it's really discriminatory that international students are not allowed to have some flexibility in terms of where they do the writing up. Some of them have families, elder parents who take care of children. I think there's a big issue in terms of postdoctoral visas. Um, so, for instance, students who have managed to get the 12 months postdoctoral visa extension and who start to teach, either as teaching fellows or senior teaching fellows, but then during the year their visa actually expires. And right now it is almost impossible for them to get an extension. So that doesn't make sense really. And I think there should be more flexibility in terms of allowing students to get involved in postdoctoral research or teaching. Then of course there's a very embarrassing bit that when we have external examiners come to show us, for instance to examine an MA program or a PhD, and we're asking them now to show their passport. And I guess an institution like SOAS, which has a very, very high number of both international students and international staff, feels particularly vulnerable. It is also that certain students from certain parts of the world and certain profiles, I think, are even more vulnerable and even more under scrutiny than others. Well, I think it's really unfortunate London, which to my mind is one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world where people from all over the world live together and share culture, food, uh, politics, struggles, um, that collectively, you know, we are now asked to um, control each other. This is part of a wider discourse which is trying to suppress political activity among all students. And it's not just students they try and suppress political activity for, but also outsourced staff um, who are often um, from outside the Europe as well. The idea that international students should somehow um, have less of a right to self-expression than EU and home students is racist, quite simply, and student unions um, must and, and are standing up for them, but um, sometimes, especially an interest of international students, it does fight a sound, feel like we're fighting a losing battle because it does feel like we're fighting the border agency rather than the institution. It's part of the whole um, system of getting uh, civil society to do your police work, civil society to do, to do your surveillance. fairly concerned people in the housing field about the provisions in the 2014 Immigration Act. The provisions of the Act um, basically say that every private landlord, including people who offer lodgings in their own home, um, including people who just rent out one house, um, once the Act comes fully into force, will have to check the immigration status of any people they're intending to have in their home. The vast majority of private landlords only rent out one home, um, and of course local authorities have been encouraging a lot of their own tenants to offer lodgings recently because it's a way of dealing with the changes in benefits that have withdrawn benefits from people who have a spare bedroom. So huge numbers of people are going to be affected by that. I'm worried about the effects on local communities across the board because the bottom line is landlords need to make their rent. That's what they're in the business for, that it's essentially a business. It's not like a local authority where they're going to take care usually, uh, with making sure that they do those checks properly and don't offend people by doing them. Landlords are simply going to say, anybody who looks a bit migranty, I'm not bothering. I'm not going to have them. And what that means is that all sorts of people who are British, all sorts of people who are settled here for many years, may well find that the private rented sector is closed to them in many areas of the UK. Landlords themselves essentially are worried that they don't understand immigration, um, after all, you know, not many people do, 
and that they'll be in a position where it's easy to catch them out and that if they don't uh, do the right thing then they'll be liable initially for a fine of £3,000 per person but if you're then caught out again the fine goes up significantly. So we're in a situation where landlords are being thrown into um, a lot of uncertainty. The things that they're being asked to do are pretty complicated and way out of the competence of most landlords. They also involve a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people potentially, having a lot of information about people's identities. Landlords have to see the person, see the relevant identity document, photocopy it or keep an electronic copy on their computer and keep that for at least 12 months after the tenancy has ended. That means an awful lot of people will know your passport number, your date of birth, where you were born and your full name and even have a photograph of you sitting around in some file in their office. Not all landlords are angels and uh, there's certainly a worry about the likelihood of some of that flowing over into identity theft. Of course, not all landlords will choose to operate the system themselves. Many landlords already use letting agencies, and letting agencies are one of the groups that's actually quite keen on the Act because they see themselves as creating a whole lot of new business out of all of, the, all of this. Um, and the government believes that as well. Um, in the impact assessment that the government uh, provided as part of the documentation around um, the passing the bill, they said that they reckoned that agencies would be making £36 million out of providing new services. Appallingly, actually, the government said this is a gain. They netted it off against the costs of over £100 million that they reckoned that the Act would incur for the Home Office, for landlords um, and for other people. But of course it's actually a cost to real people, this new market so-called for agencies, because agencies will charge it back both to the landlord and the tenant. We're going to see an increasing number of people who realise that they have become in effect undocumented, not even necessarily migrants, but people who um, have, are unable to produce their documents. And the striking thing about this is that the agencies I've spoken to and the people I've spoken to who are in this situation are all of them, without exception, people who are from black and minority ethnic communities. Now, I know how I lose things, and I'm pretty sure that the ability to forget things and lose things is not racially defined. I'm pretty sure that people like me are losing documents as well, but they're being given a buy by the various authorities who just say, oh, well, obviously, you know, you say you were born in London, of course you are. Other people are not being given the benefit of the doubt, and what's going on there is very clear, and let's name it, it's racial discrimination. The concern will be from some ethnic minority landlords that just like with ethnic minority employers, that they'll get targeted and there'll be highly publicised raids on properties owned by people like that. Whenever they do a raid on so-called beds in sheds, they publicise the fact that the Home Office are also involved in the raids. Now, actually, most of the landlords of these beds in sheds are not migrants. Okay, It's the tenants who are the migrants, and it's the tenants who are paying um, often hugely expensive rents to live in completely uninhabitable accommodation who are then targeted... So the emphasis is that basically being a migrant is in itself almost a crime. Uh, being an exploitative landlord who rents out a shed may well be something that will incur a fine and all sorts of other opprobrium, but you're not, not going to get targeted by the UK Home Office because actually you know, the, the target there is to be able to pick up a few people who may be working in contravention of their student visa or something like that. So there's a real issue about uh, how the targeting happens and who, who it's actually focused on. So basically um, the issue is going to be that landlords are going to say, well, in order to carry this out, I'm going to just not even look at people who can't produce the documents, whatever their situation is. So what happens then is that those people have to look at landlords who will not be implementing the legislation. And inevitably, they are likely to be landlords who are not implementing the other legislation as well. So there'll be landlords that are offering uh, homes that are unfit for human habitation, um, that are not properly controlled um, by licensing arrangements and things like that. We're not only providing agents with a massive new £36 million market for their services, we're also basically creating a market for landlords who will turn a blind eye to the law. 
and we're increasing their ability to find tenants. And that is obviously going to stack up into major problems later on. And unfortunately, I think it's quite likely to stack up into problems where people will suffer physically. Uh, landlords who offer accommodation outside the law um, already are putting their tenants in danger. The London Fire Service is very concerned about the number of times they've been called to fires that have been created in accommodation like that that is uh, you know, being operated outside the law. Sooner or later, people are going to get killed in that accommodation because of the lack of safety precautions and the, uh, the poor wiring and the overcrowding and the lack of fire alarms and things like that. Um, and the government, in effect, is giving that market and illegal accommodation a huge fillip by introducing the legislation. Those women I've seen with an immigration issue are often contemplated or attempted suicide. Not only do they have nightmares of the violence and abuse that they've been subjected to, but they're now, in addition, having fears and nightmares about being raided and picked up. They raid in the morning, 6 o'clock, and uh, in the morning it was so scary. My son started crying when they came. And he was so scared. He was thinking, what's going to happen next? Yes. What happened to my mom? What's going to happen to my mom? So what's going to happen to my dad? He, they're so scared. It's, it's like you are always afraid that maybe one day you'll be thrown out on the street. Some landlords use it mm. to intimidate you into yes. sexual activities. The, the situation is degrading you as a human being. Because if you're in this particular situation where you can't even afford to buy your medication, you can't pay for your house rent, you are forced. If you, are, if you don't have strong will, you are forced to do anything in order to get it. I, I am an example. There has been a situation where the landlord was telling me that it would be much better for me to accept his sexual advances in order to stay in the house. It's true. It's one of the things that made me to leave that place, but you leave it to a worse situation. situation. When you go out on street, station or bus, immigration people, they are checking your status. When you go to NHS, you have to show your passport. So I feel so suffocated all the time. Do I deserve this kind of life? I suffered my childhood. My brother was controlling my life. After that, my husband and his family, they were controlling my life. And now, certain of the point in this country, I am... The immigration is controlling my life. So, every time, I feel like, where can I get free? I'm telling my counselling all the time. I want to breathe. I want to... I'm just... Watching out of the window. I'm not allowed to work. I'm not allowed to do anything. I'm just sitting home and No money. No money for medication and every time I'm thinking it's better to die rather than living this kind of horrible life So on the one hand the state is saying please come forward and report domestic violence and rape But on the other hand what they're not doing is protecting the most vulnerable in society And those are those women who don't have a status often in the country or they're imprisoned in their homes and can't get out because there's a control over the family and the parents over somebody's status. What we're seeing currently is some of society's most vulnerable people falling through the cracks of the, of the current system. This includes people who are living and working in exploitative situations, people who have been trafficked to the UK, and we see a significant number of people who have fled their home country having survived traumatic events, fleeing conflict, having been imprisoned and tortured and having been persecuted. We know that one in every five of our patients who's been to see us over the last eight years hasn't accessed any medical, medical care prior to seeing us because they've been too afraid 
because they have thought that they may be detained if they go and see a doctor. For us, that's something which has to change. Frontline staff are ill-informed, are unaware of what patients' rights are, and patients themselves are unaware of their own rights. And so what we see is frontline staff turning patients away from healthcare, which that patient has um, the full right to access. This is a concern not just for the patient who is going to not access care at that point then until they're much more acutely ill, and often then will access care through A&E, which means that they've got to a stage where their, their condition is much more serious, so it's obviously more concerning for them. But also, that's a significantly greater cost for the health system. We're not saving resources if all we're doing is push, pushing people towards using already overstretched accident and emergency services. At the clinic here, we see some people who we need to triage immediately to accident and emergency. They've waited for too long before they access our services and really they're quite well need to access acute emergency medicine. So our concern is if these proposals to start charging for access to accident and emergency go through, we're going to struggle to persuade people to access A&Es as a point of access when they're extremely unwell. So if you have somebody who's suffering significant chest pain and maybe having a heart attack, but is thinking twice because they know they can't afford to pay the bill, or you have a mum who's got a baby which has got a fever overnight and instead of actually taking the baby to hospital, um, will hold back and think, actually, let's just see if the, baby, if the child gets better on its own. So these are our worries there. What we've seen accompanying this bill as it's gone through and become an act is a significant amount of rhetoric from politicians and from personalities in the media. Really vilifying migrants and immigrants and putting, making them responsible for the difficulties which the NHS um, is, finds itself in. And really that doesn't reflect what we see here in the clinic on a day-to-day -day basis. People are not aware that they're entitled to access healthcare services. Um, if health tourism exists, it doesn't exist on the grand scale that, that it's being alleged that it does, really. And the changes which are being proposed we don't think are cost-effective and we don't think make economic sense or public health sense. My name is Brad. I'm a clinic support worker at Doctors of World Clinic. People who come to the clinic um, clearly have problems accessing primary health care. They're scared to go to A&E, or they're scared to go to a walk-in clinic, or they're scared to, to, to go anywhere in a GP surgery, or they've had a bad experience at a GP surgery, where a GP's receptionist has acted like an, a, a border agent, effectively, and asked for, for immigration documentation, which is not their job. People who arrive here at our clinic are very, very, very desperate, often, have gone through physical torture, they've been raped, you know, it, there's a whole gamut of experiences they've had. Um, and I don't see why people in that vulnerable situation should be denied access to health care. The broader impact on society is that you start to have uh, tiers of society that have different levels of access to public services. And this is fundamentally wrong, particularly when this starts to happen on, on, on a migration basis. You're looking at um, it's based on someone's immigration status. Um, you start to look at all kinds of ethnic classifications and it's quite worrying. People who are not, not white British or European face significantly more questions that other people are not asked. Do you have a passport? Where's your passport? Where's your visa? GP patient relationship should be based on trust, privacy and, and, and in the end it should be productive. It should be a conversation. You can't have a conversation if you're worried that the person you're talking to might be telling the border police about you or, or your immigration status. That fundamentally breaks the doctor-patient relationship and this will not be end in a healthy situation for the patient and will not end in a healthy situation for the society. We've seen several enforcement operations in our time um, at Ramfell and the most prominent one was oper obviously Operation Vulcan which was a, everybody knows as the go-home vans and that signalled a very public image of Im immigration enforcement that's become more and more common day and everyday practice now. We then also uncovered something called Operation Nexus which is about uh, Home Office officers being embedded inside police custody suites. 
That concerns us greatly because what that now means is that anybody engaging with the Metropolitan Police or any police anywhere in the country now actually is quite fearful about what's happening to their information. Are they being used for intelligence? Is the information they're given, even as a victim, going to be used later on against them? And we've had incidences where victims and witnesses have refused to go forward because there's this understanding that the Home Office and the Metropolitan Police work far too closely together. A great deal of Ramfell's work is centred around street-based homelessness and a large proportion of those individuals are from Central and Eastern European countries. A lot of them will identify as have been the victims of crime, racial or verbal abuse, and actually haven't reported it to the police because they're too fearful of the consequences. Um, literally what I do here is just um, helping most of the homeless people, giving food out, giving them what they want. It's been hard feeling like seeing people come in here like just helpless like they, there's nothing they can do just to make them a better person but all they will do week at week in week out is just come here and get food for their family kids and all that the first week i walked here i literally i was saying to rita like rita i'm a man they say my men don't cry but i was crying inside of me Operation Skybreaker was introduced in July 2014. It marked a new way for the Home Office to work. Well, that's how they described it. And it centred on the fact that they wanted to engage with local communities. The real interesting thing about Skybreaker was that the Home Office sought to and succeeded in penetrating some local faith organisations. So they started developing surgeries, outreach opportunities at these um, faith organisations with the intention of asking the faith organisations to report anybody who had immigration problems. So the impact has been to actually close down any opportunities where people who would have immigration problems could actually feel safe. From Ramfell's experience, we are growing increasingly suspicious about the way the Home Office is trying to infiltrate local authorities, and that ranges from children's social care departments to their housing departments. It's not uncommon to hear of local authorities having embedded officers from the Home Office within their teams, and the suggestion is always that they're there to catch people who are applying for benefits or support fraudulently. Well, it may be, but it's also about gathering intelligence and actually tracking and widening the pool of people that can be caught by Home Office Immigration Enforcement. It concerns us greatly. There is a lot of campaigning work that goes on amongst refugee and migrant organisations. A lot of good work that goes on to challenge, but we challenge in silos. We don't challenge constructively. So the Home Office has been able to create this hostile environment all around us and we're just poking at it. We're just poking here and there to try and make a little bit of a difference. What we actually need to do is push right back. Everyone has the right to live in this country. They actually pay taxes, they work hard. There's a very good business argument to actually say, if you force people into this hostile environment, they end up needing emergency services. You push them underground and they end up in a crisis mode. When that happens, you then end up having to pay more out of the public purse. When you look at who the Home Office is targeting, it's targeting people who have stakes in the electoral system. So landlords, our, um, employers, people who have political clout in one way or another, whether that's through the, their payment of taxes, business rates or whatever. And I think there is great mileage in some of these individuals pushing back. crossing borders, um, either you know as permanent migrants or at least for some part of their of their working lives, um, and you know whole cities are emerging where their economy seems to be based very largely on that process. Um, London being an obvious example of it, but you know there's there's half a dozen 
global cities in Europe, which are major engines, which are driving this process of, of people movement. So that's happening, and you know those processes are actually facilitating. They're, they're, they're opening up the channels in which people move. Um, but on the other hand, there is very definitely a, a failure uh, on the part of politics to keep up with that process. Um, there's a, an entrenched assumption that the proper way for people to live their lives is to stay in one place, um, you know, pretty well close to where you were born and the, the community that nurtured you, um, and to you know habitually regard everybody for outside of that as being strangers and potentially problematic, who we have to be wary about. Um, and very often, you know, our parliamentary politics actually reinforces. Um, all of that. It's very, very poorly adapted for being able to um, to relate to the experiences of people who are in movement. The difference between between now and 15, 20 years ago um, is that people felt that they were on course for integration. Um, it might be slow, it might be, you know, step by step, um, but they generally felt that all the problems that were going to be cropping up on the way um, it was within their means, either through their own personal resources or through the, the networks that they built up and generally extended as they became more familiar and made wider circles of friends. Um, and, you know, by and large it contributed to probably what is quite a good record as far as the UK is concerned, which, you know, generally as far as Europe is concerned, is generally considered to have a better record in terms of the integration of its migrant communities. Um, I think we really have to be concerned that we more or less put a full stop um, to that now. Um, that people who you know, find themselves in a difficult situation with their immigration status um, cannot be quite so optimistic that over time they will find a way to sort it out. Um, that you know, life will gradually become better. Um, that they will extend their circles of, of friends and contacts. Um, that they will feel more and more part of the community that they're living in. Um, I think, you know, we, we could very well be institutionalising a, a, um, a sort of a shadow life um, for a group of people who just permanently think of themselves as having to dodge and, and duck and, and weave in whatever little, you know, spaces exist for them. And they will do it. They're used to hardship, these people, and they're used to, you know, dealing with issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but the question we've got to ask ourselves is whether that's good enough. Um, if, our, um, if, if what we're ambitious for is a, is a social cohesion, societies where, where people feel they belong and that they're contributing and that they're getting a, a proper return for their efforts. Do we want ghettos? Do we want shadows? Do we want spaces where every, you know, people live outside of the public gaze? And I'm, you know, that is the effect of a hostile environment. We're building, building something that looks very frighteningly like that. My worry with the inevitable increase in discrimination that this is going to produce is that over time, if you like, the iron enters the soul for a lot of young people in Britain. When they, the first time they leave home, they have demands for documents at every turn, even if they've been born and brought up in the area where they're now living, then what that feels like is that there are different classes of citizen, that there are different classes of resident, and that they are in the class that gets excluded routinely from everything. And what that leads to, of course, is an abiding sense of injustice and unfairness and a lack of trust in institutions. And that inevitably uh, leads to quite a breakdown in, uh, in, in the communities that we live in. What we've seen in this film is that people are required now, as part of their citizenship duties, to become everyday border guards and to be sus suspected as being illegal border crossers. Historically, multiculturalist policies emerged in Britain and elsewhere as a way of enhancing as well as transforming the welfare state to include people's 
cultural rights in addition to their social, civic and political rights. What we are seeing these days is not only that rights are being taken away from people, but also the generic sense of entitlement that citizenship, membership in the community, membership in the society has given to all of us in terms of basic rights to be able to live in a reasonable place, to get reasonable health care, to get reasonable education, to get reasonable employment. Stop being taken for granted. We are now required to examine everybody and demand that they prove to us that they have rights to do so. We are now required to prove to others that indeed we have the rights to do it. These have very destructive influence and effects, both on individuals and their sense of self-worth as well as on social relationships within families, within communities, among families. Given other aspects of instability and risk as a result of the major economic, social, political, military developments all over the world and in Britain, this kind of practices, this kind of changes, instead of helping us to guard against the destruction of our quality of life and well-being, become contributing factors to this reality. Our studies showed that people become more frightened, not less frightened. Everyday bordering have come to be a major technology of management of both diversity and discourses of diversity in contemporary British life and that the emerging legislation is only enhancing it. One of the aspects that have come up in our findings that have created a lot of bitterness among those that we interviewed is the fact that this new technology of everyday bordering is generating lots of revenue for the state that people are required to pay huge fines, tens of thousands of pounds, if they're found not to have played their role as border guards properly. People find themselves isolated vis-a-vis -vis agents of the state and people outside the state who are required by the state now to become their border guards. This is a major change in people's lives in metropolitan London, in Britain in general, and we found out that also in other parts of Europe. And of course, we hear also similar things from North America and other parts of the world. In this film, we have tried to share with you some of the fundings of our research. How borders from something that has been marginal in most people's lives have come to play major parts in people's everyday lives. 